Good morning, brethren. Happy Sabbath to you all. Special greetings to those who are joining us on Zoom. It's good to have you with us. And special greetings to all our visitors here today. So um, it's good to have all of you here with us today. Brethren, in a few days' time, on December the 25th, the Christian world will be, set, will be focusing on the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, many Christian churches teach and believe that Jesus was born on December 25th, and they will be celebrating his birth on that day. Now, their focus will be on the Messiah's first coming as a baby in a manger in the town of Bethlehem. Now, Christmas is now celebrated each year in remembrance of Jesus' birth, and it has become one of the largest celebrations in the world. Now, during these celebrations, certain scriptures from the Bible are often quoted. And I would now like to look at one of the more popular ones. So let's go to Luke chapter 2 for that scripture, Luke chapter 2. I'm sure many of us are familiar with it because we tend to hear it a lot around this time of the year. Luke chapter 2 and let's begin in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to, to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and to earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now, many believe that Jesus came approximately 2,000 years ago to bring peace on earth. But is this correct? What did Jesus actually say himself? And let's look at Luke chapter 12 to see what Jesus actually said. Luke chapter 12, and let's begin verse 51. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Brethren, Jesus says here that he did not come to bring peace. Instead, he says he came to bring division. And brethren, as we look around in the world today, we see a world that lacks peace. And we see a world filled with war and division. Nation is divided against nation. Race against race, tribe against tribe, family members against other family members. Regent, in the past, we have had two world, two world wars, and presently we have a number of wars going on. War between Russia and Ukraine, 
between Israel and Hamas. And we also have a number of smaller wars going on in Africa and Somalia, Sudan, etc. We also have potential wars that may occur in the future. For example, we hear of possible wars in the future between China and Taiwan, between North Korea and South Korea, and even near us right here in the Caribbean between Venezuela and Guyana. Now, Jesus identified war as one of the signs that his second coming was near. And let's see what he said about his return to earth and the end of the age that we are in. So let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And let's look, start from verse uh, 3. Matthew 24 verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Brethren, the first sign Jesus gave of the end of his of this age and the return of um, his return to earth was religious deception. Many will come preaching in his name and will deceive many. Now, this has come to pass with many false churches existing today who preach about Christ but fail to preach the gospel that Jesus preached about the coming kingdom of God. Now, the second sign was wars and rumors of wars. Now, this also has been fulfilled and is presently being fulfilled. Now, Jesus went on to give other signs that will occur in the rest of his chapter, in the rest of this chapter, before he actually returns. Now, all these signs will then culminate in a final period of trouble called the Great Tribulation. And let's drop down to verse 21 of Matthew chapter 24 to see where he mentions that. Verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Brethren, when the great tribulation arises, it will be a time of trouble on the whole world. That if Jesus Christ did not return to stop it, no flesh would be saved alive. In other words, all life on earth would be completely destroyed. Thankfully, however, the Bible shows that Jesus Christ will return to take charge of world affairs and stop the destruction and then establish the kingdom of God here on earth. Now, the history of mankind has shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that man is unable to rule himself and his fellow man. The history of the world is one of wars, famine, starvation, disease, pain and suffering, and ultimately death. Mankind's only hope is Jesus Christ returning to set up the kingdom of God and take rulership of this world. 
And that brings me to the title of the sermon today. And the title is The Coming Kingdom of God. Brethren, the establishment of the kingdom of God is described in the book of Revelation, which describes the events that will occur in the future. So let's go to Revelation and let's look at chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 and let's begin in verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Brethren, the kingdoms of this world will no longer be ruled by human beings, but by, but by Jesus Christ and his prophets and saints. Now, the saints comprise members of the Church of God who from the start of the church back in AD 31 have been trained to be kings and priests to rule with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And let's see where that is mentioned. So let's go to Revelation chapter 1 and let's begin in verse 4. Revelation 1 verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Brethren, the reward of the saints will be to rule with Jesus Christ as kings and priests over the nations of the world. And those saints will now be resurrected as spirit beings. And they will have eternal life just like Jesus Christ after he was resurrected from the dead. Now, this resurrection is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So let's go across to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And let's begin in verse 13. Verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the trumpet, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Brethren, the Apostle Paul here describes the return of Jesus Christ and the saints who are dead in the grave will rise to meet him in the air as spirit beings. They will no longer be composed of flesh and blood. And the saints who are alive at that time will also be changed to spirit beings and both groups will meet Jesus Christ in the air. Now, this change to a spirit being is also described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So let's go across to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see what is described there. 1 Corinthians 15 and let's begin in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, okay, uh, yes, for this corruptible must put on corruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Brethren, when the dead are res resurrected, they change from corruptible mortal beings to incorruptible immortal beings who can never die. And this is confirmed in verse 54. So let's continue to verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Brethren, those who experience this change to immortal, to an immortal spirit being will now have eternal life and will live for eternity and beyond. Now, this is the destiny of all human beings and what salvation is all about. And God has decreed that every human being will experience a resurrection at some point in time. And let's Go to verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which confirms that. Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Brethren, after a person dies, all shall be made alive again. Now this is a promise that God has made to all human beings. The physical death we all will experience at some point is not the end. There is a future beyond this physical human life that we presently experience. And this truth has been hidden from most human beings. As we read earlier in verse 51, it is a mystery. And most human beings have been deceived into believing that when a person dies, they either go to heaven or hell. The common belief is that the good go to heaven 
and the wicked go to hell. And that those who go to heaven will live in paradise with God and Jesus Christ for all eternity in peace, happiness, and joy. But that is not what the Bible says. The Bible clearly says, states that no one has gone to heaven. And the only person who has gone to heaven is Jesus Christ. And he actually came from heaven. And let's see where that is stated. Let's go to John chapter 3 and verse 13. Jesus is speaking here. And in verse 13, he says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Now, this verse clearly shows that the only person to have gone to heaven was Jesus Christ, who actually came from heaven. And if anyone should have ascended to heaven, it should have been King David, who, is, who was described as a man after God's heart. And let's see what the Bible says about David. So let's go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 34. Acts chapter 2 and verse 34 says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. Brethren, David is not in heaven. He is presently in his grave, asleep, like the rest of the dead awaiting the resurrection. Now, along with this false teaching of going to heaven when you die, is that those who go to hell, on the other hand, will live in torment in a fiery burning hellfire for all eternity. Now, as we have seen, the Bible instead teaches the doctrine of the resurrections and it is one of the fun foundational doctrines of the church of god and let's see where that is stated so let's go to hebrews chapter 6 hebrews chapter 6 and let's begin in verse 1 therefore Leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Brethren, the resurrection of the dead is listed here among the elementary principles of Christ, which every Christian must have a good understanding of. It is listed among repentance, faith, baptism, laying on of hands, and eternal judgment. And brethren, the resurrection of the dead is actually the hope of every Christian. And it is something we strive to attain to. However, everyone will not be resurrected at the same time. There is an order to the resurrections. And let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which describes that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And verse 23, we earlier read 20 to 22. And verse 23 says, But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Brethren, this verse introduces the concept of an order in the resurrections. Jesus first, and then those who are his next. Now, Jesus Christ, 
was the first person to be resurrected to spirit life. Now, there have been resurrections before his, but those were to physical life. Now, we may be familiar with the resurrections that occurred in the Old Testament with Elijah and Elijah, who brought the widow's sons back to life, who had died. We also have the example of Lazarus, who had died and, Jesus, and who Jesus brought back to life. Now, those who are Christ will be resurrected at his first coming. Sorry, at his second coming. And this resurrection of the saints is referred to as the first resurrection. And it is a resurrection to eternal life as a spirit being. Now, the Bible actually calls this resurrection of the saints to eternal life the first resurrection. And let's see where that is stated. So let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Brethren, these verses focus on the first resurrection and describe who will be in it. And those who are in the first resurrection will reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Now, reigning with Jesus Christ for a thousand years is mentioned twice in these verses. And it's describing us, the saints of God who have been called now to prepare for that time. Now, the term... First resurrection, the, the term first resurrection is mentioned twice in these verses. Now, the implication is that if there's a first resurrection, then there's also a second resurrection and possibly a third. Now, the Church of God actually believes that there are three resurrections. A first, a second, and then a third. And we believe this based on the rest of the verses mentioned here in chapter 20. Now, I like to refer to this chapter in Revelation as the resurrection chapter. So let's continue in verse 11 of chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Brethren, these verses describe what is called the great white throne judgment. 
It describes a judgment of the dead who have been resurrected to physical life. And this resurrection is for those who were never called by God during their lifetimes. They never had a chance for salvation. They never heard about Jesus Christ and never had the opportunity to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. And it includes people from the time of Adam and Eve up to the return of Jesus Christ. And it includes those who were Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and all the other religions that have existed over millennia. Now those in this second resurrection will have the books of the Bible opened up to them for the first time, and they will now be able to understand it. The veil that covered their eyes will now be lifted and they will now understand God's plan of salvation. They will now be taught God's way of life. And we the saints will have an important part to play in teaching them God's way of life, which is based on keeping God's laws. The book of life will then be opened up to them and they will be given the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit and then have their names written in that book. Brethren, we have our names written in that book now and they will get their opportunity then. Brethren, this second resurrection described here guarantees that everyone has a chance to be saved. No one is left out. This will be their first opportunity to learn who God is and what his way of life is about. God is fair and just. Everyone will have their opportunity to be part of the family of God and eventually the kingdom of God. God is just doing it in a particular order. Now, this second resurrection to physical life is also described in the book of Ezekiel. And let's look at that in Ezekiel chapter 37. Let's begin in verse 1, Ezekiel 37. Now the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the, in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the 
breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from, the grave, from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. But when these verses describe the whole house of Israel being resurrected to physical life once again, they would now be given access to God's Holy Spirit and then eventually to eternal life. Now, previously, God did not place his spirit within them, except for the few prophets and righteous men and women identified in the Bible. The children of Israel here would now get their first opportunity to be saved. Now, when this event is combined with the billions of Gentiles, also receiving their first opportunity be, to be saved. Imagine what a great time this will be. Now, this understanding is unique to the church of God. Now, most churches tend to teach that if someone is not saved now, they are lost forever and will end up in the lake of fire. Brethren, what a wonderful blessing to understand this truth that has been hidden from the eyes of so many. And this reminds me of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. And let's go to Matthew chapter 11 and look at verse 25. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Now, what things have been hidden? To understand what Jesus is referring to, we need to back up to the previous verses. So let's go back and look at, start at verse 20 of Matthew 11. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Brethren, Jesus is here saying that there will be a future time of judgment when the deeds of the people from different cities will be compared 
with those of others. And the judgment Jesus is referring to here is the great white throne judgment. When these individuals would be resurrected and their deeds judged. Now Jesus makes a similar statement in Matthew chapter 12. And let's go to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Brethren, the judgment Jesus is referring to here once again is the great white throne judgment. When the men of Nineveh and the queen of Sheba will be resurrected to physical life once again with the Jews who lived in Jesus' time. And these Gentiles will criticize the Jews for their lack of belief in Christ and for rejecting him while he was in the flesh. All brethren will then be given the opportunity to repent of their deeds and be given their chance for salvation. And brethren, we will be there to help and guide them in this process. Now, at that time, most will accept the offer of eternal life and become members of the family of God. Sadly, however, there will be some who reject God's offer of eternal life. And besides these, uh, at that time who reject God's offer, there would also be those who would have rejected God's offer during their lifetime. Now, let's see what their fate will be. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 20 and see what happens to those who reject God's way of life. Revelation 20, and let's continue in verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Now, verse 13 here is referring to another resurrection that occurs after the second resurrection, which we read previously in verse 12. Now, since it occurs after the second resurrection, it can be called the third resurrection. Now, we need to notice that those in this resurrection do not have the books of life, sorry, the books of the Bible and the book of life being open to them, as happened with those in the second resurrection. It just says that they were judged according to their works. Now, why are the books of the Bible not open to them? Well, because they will have already rejected the instruction in these books. Therefore, they will now be judged according to their unrepentant works. Now, Scripture reveals all mankind must appear before Christ to give an account of their actions. And we read that in Romans chapter 14. So let's look at that quickly. Romans chapter 14, and let's look at verse 10. 10 to 12, verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, 
As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Brethren, everyone must appear before Christ to be judged. And this applies to both the good and the wicked. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which also shows this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's look at verse 10. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Brethren, no one gets away. Both good and bad people have to appear before Jesus Christ. And since everyone must be judged, everyone must be resurrected. Let's look at Acts 24 as well. Acts 24, and let's look at verse 15. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Brethren, the just will be in the first resurrection, while the unjust mentioned here is referring to those either in the second or third resurrections or both. Now, let's also look at Daniel, book of Daniel. And let's look at chapter 12. Chapter 12 was quoted in the Simonet. So let's look at Daniel 12 and verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Brethren, those who receive everlasting life will be in the first resurrection. And those who receive shame and everlasting contempt are those in the third resurrection. Now, this is not referring to those in the second resurrection because those in the second resurrection will still have the opportunity to receive eternal life. So, brethren, we have seen that the first resurrection is reserved for righteous Christians who endure to the end. The second resurrection is for those who never offered the opportunity for eternal life because they were never called during their lifetime. And the only people who are not accounted for in the first and second resurrections are those who, are, who were called by God and then utterly rejected God's offer of salvation while they were alive. And they are therefore not in the first resurrection. And the third resurrection is reserved for these individuals. Now, the third resurrection is then followed by the lake of fire in which all wicked people will be cast. So let's go back to Revelation 20 to see where the lake of fire is mentioned. Revelation 20 and verses 14 and 15. Then death and hates were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But during this lake of fire, also called the second death, is one from which there is no resurrection. 
no hope of life after that. And this fire will burn up all wicked people who have rejected God's way of life and refuse to repent, who refuse to submit to God and his government. So the Bible describes three distinct groups of people. The converted, the blinded, and the wicked. And I have here a table which uh, shows these three groups. The converted will be in the first resurrection. The blinded will be in the second resurrection. And the wicked in the third resurrection. Now the sequence described in Revelation 20 is that of three separate resurrections which involve three distinct groups of people who have lived here on earth. So in conclusion, brethren, God has a plan to save all human beings who have ever lived. It is a marvelous, awesome plan that most people are not aware of. But God has revealed his plan to members of his church. And we now have a responsibility to share this knowledge and understanding of his plan as a witness to the rest of the world. Now, the good news of the coming kingdom of God is the message that Jesus brought to this world. And we have been commissioned as members of his church to preach this gospel to the world. The coming kingdom of God is the only hope for mankind to save it from total destruction. So, brethren, let us always remember to pray as Jesus said to his disciples. Our Father in, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come.